This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. You're live. Hi, I'm Joelle Simone Pietri from the uh, member of the Hawaii Energy Policy <coughs> Forum. I'm filling in for Sharon Moriwaki today. And um, I'm going to be introducing a few guests. Uh, one here in the studio, Dr. Scott Turn from the University of Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And then also we have two guests on the line uh, from the U.S. mainland, as we like to say here. So we're going to have um, Ms. Carol Sim, the Assistant Director of the Federal Aviation Administration's Aviation Sustainability Center of Excellence, or ASCENT for short, and Mr. Steve Zonka, the Executive Director of a different FAA center, the um, Alter Commercial Alternative Aviation Fuel Initiative, or CAFI for short. So. Um, uh, again, so we're uh, enjoying beautiful weather here in Hawaii, and um, they're enjoying not quite as beautiful weather probably in Ohio and Washington State, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So first I'd like to bring up Carol and uh, introduce the Aviation Sustainability Ex Center of Excellence to us. Carol, over to you. Thank you, Joelle, and good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of Ascent. And yes, I'm in Portland, Oregon, and got two inches of snow last night, <laughs> much warmer in Hawaii. The center is an FAA center of excellence that's focused on jet fuel, aviation jet fuel, and the environment. We work to create science-based solutions for the aviation industry's biggest challenges. If you look at an image, you can see that we're a cooperative aviation research organization that's co-led by Washington State University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And then we have across the country 16 various university partners that help support the research <laughs> of the center. In addition to that, we have approximately 60 industry stakeholders. You should be able to see um, a list of those stakeholders and university partners on your screen as well. The industry partners work as an advisory committee to help direct some of the efforts of, um, of the center. ASCEN is primarily funded by um, the FAA with contributions from other federal agencies such as NASA, the Department of Defense, the Environmental Protection Agency, and Transport Canada. Research conducted by the university partners is directed by the FAA's Office of Environment and Energy and is focused in four key areas, one of which is alternative fuels. We're also looking at aviation emissions, community noise impacts, and aircraft operations and um, including um, optimized descent profile and maximizing flight paths to reduce um, energy. Although ascent research projects address all of these topics today, we're just really going to focus on the alternative jet fuel activities associated with the center. It's also worth noting, and I think in the next image, um, that the work of the center supports the federal alternative jet fuels research and development strategy. That strategy is to enhance energy security, expand domestic energy sources, facilitate a diverse, secure, and reliable fuel supply, reduce emissions that affect both local air quality and global climate impacts, want to generate economic and rural development, and then finally promote social welfare. The five key ascent projects that are focused on as alternative fuels include feedstock development, um, processing, and conversion yeah, go to pathways. A Carol, go to and Dr. Carol. Turn will be talking about that a bit later. We also are looking Switch at regional Carol's supply camera. chains and refining infrastructure. It's really key to remember that there is no silver bullet feedstock across the U.S. It really depends on the local region and what feedstock it can produce, either growing those feedstock or harvesting for farms residual. So Scott will be talking a bit more on what is available in Hawaii. The center also looks at um, environmental benefits analysis, so the life cycle um, analyses of <clears throat> excuse me, alternative fuels, looking at from farm to fly versus from an oil well to the engine as well. We also, not so much as, as interest in Hawaii right now, but look at air power, excuse me, aircraft um, component deterioration and where we want to make sure that that alternative fuels are not causing any impact to the engine or other components that could decrease performance or increase maintenance costs. And then we also have a fuel performance testing through the National Jet Fuel Combustion Program. And as you can imagine that there's very rigorous testing that needs to go into alternative fuels to ensure that they meet the very rigorous safety and performance standards as proposed 
control in general. All of these projects that I've described um, go into a toolkit that Ascent uses to help FAA develop an advanced analytical tool that help inform some of their regulatory activities. Um, the Ascent research also helps support some international goals, and we have an image that will show that the international aviation community supports efforts to decarbonize aviation fuels. And through the International image Civil four. Aviation Organization Committee on Aviation and Environmental Protection, it will show that the international aviation industry has committed to carbon neutral growth from 2020 and a 50% reduction in aviation emissions by 2050 compared to a 2005 baseline. In order to do that, we can look at yeah, technology and operational uh, it should look like a chart but that goes up um, like availability of commercial supplies of sustainability, sustainable alternative fuels is essential for the industry to meet that goal. You have an image on your screen with a big section in the middle that really shows where the alternative fuels come in and how that will support the industry. With that, I think I'm going to turn it back to Joelle and she will introduce Tanaka from CAPI and Scott and the work that they're doing in this area. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you, Carol. And, um, you know, you covered a lot of ground there. So uh, if you can bring up back up that last image you just talked at, um, a lot of uh, frequently asked question that uh, those of us involved in renewable fuels get asked is, well, what else are you doing? Um, that's not just fuels. So uh, what we're showing in this graph here, this is the International Civil Aviation Organization. Basically, all commercial airlines are members of this organization. And um, it, it regulates uh, commercial aviation operations globally. And this is the plan for carbon neutral dr growth from 2020 onwards. Today's show is actually going to be a deep dive into that light green triangle on the lower right-hand side, the sustainable alternative fuels and market-based measures. There's lots of other things that can be done and are being done, and um, the slide also points to ATM for air traffic management and infrastructure. Those are some measures that here in the state of Hawaii uh, can actually be done at Hawaii's airports, for example. But um, for this green triangle, um, uh, this um, th this area is one of the primary focus areas for Steve Zonka and the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuel Initiative. So um, maybe Steve, if we could turn to you and uh, you could give us a an introduction to Kathy, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Sure, Joelle. Uh, Steve Zonka here. I'm the executive director of the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. Kathy uh, has been in existence for about 12 years. And um, I think uh, the image two of, uh, or image, slide two of image six uh, gives a little bit of background on CAPI. CAPI is actually not uh, an FAA entity uh, like Ascent is. CAPI is actually a public-private partnership uh, between the aviation industry and the government with our primary uh, governmental sponsor being the FAA. But our other sponsors are the Aerospace Industries Association, Airports Council International, and Airlines for America, uh, in addition to the FAA. So it, it's basically um, a pretty broad segment of the industry, the people who make um, the equipment that we fly. Bring up the PowerPoint presentation called Image 6, and um, that'll show what some of the stuff Steve's talking about. Um, it, uh, Air, the Aerospace Industries Association, those are the folks who make the equipment that we fly. Airports Council represents the airports where we fly in and out of, and Airlines for America represents the uh, the carriers who are flying. So uh, CAPI really represents the fact that there's about a 25 billion gallon per year U.S. jet market pool. Uh, that, that Joelle mentioned a minute ago that's shown in the uh, the wedge charts that reflect our uh, commitments to improving our uh, life cycle CO2. So we're in, uh, the aviation industry established to facilitate and promote the introduction of alternative aviation fuel. So Carol described a lot of things that are being done on a scientific basis. Um, some R&D exploration, the evaluation of business models, etc. And what CAPI is focused on is working with the industry, trying to establish complete supply chains that will actually result in the production 
of sustainable alternative jet fuel and the sale of that fuel to airlines. We have uh, done a lot of work uh, over the last several years to create um, basically the, the language, the vernacular that the industry is using to to work to stand up a new industrial sector for the production of renewable fuels. Um, our goals with respect to those fuels are that they deliver equivalent safety and performance, that we can get them at comparable cost to petroleum-based fuel, that they provide environmental improvement and um, enable the security of energy supply for aviation. And we've demonstrated over the last decade that we can do that through the production of synthetic kerosene, primarily from renewable sources. And it is a, a very broad range of renewable sources that we'll talk more about. Um, if you go to the last uh, image in that set that I provided, um, this is just one part of the work that uh, CAPI has done. And, it, and, and when I talk about CAPI, I'm really talking about the entire industry. Um, CAPI is a, is a focal for many of these activities, but it takes the, the full industry to execute on some of these things that we're doing. The last slide is a reflection of the approach that we use to develop and approve a new type of synthetic jet fuel. In the background, there's a background diagram there that starts in, that toward the uh, lower right hand of that uh, image. It starts with Tier 1, and it's got a series of arrows that fall all the way through to a final ASTM uh, approval. That process basically requires that we understand what the physical fuel properties are, that they meet the specifications for normal jet fuel, we ensure that they uh, interact normally with uh, materials that are uh, found in aviation products. And when we find that we've got a fuel composition that meets those criteria, then we go off and do component and rig testing to ensure that we get the characteristics that we're after. And finally, we'll potentially do engine and APU testing, either on the ground and in some cases in the air. All of that information is compiled and the entire industry working as a unit then reviews that data and approves the, the uh, qualification of that fuel. In the lower left-hand side, what you see are five approved fuels that the industry has uh, approved over the last uh, five years, six years. Um, those are represented by the annexes. I uh, won't go into the detail of what those are at the minute. I think Joel has a summary slide later that, that defines those. And then the next uh, box up, there are some green boxes, and those reflect um, approaches that are in, in the process of getting final qualification. Um, and at least two of those we expect to be approved by the end of this year. If we're lucky, we'll get three. And then in the, in the top of that section, three green boxes and another blue one. And those are processes that are, uh, or conversion uh, techniques that are sort of in process. And in the upper left-hand side, you see that we have about 15 additional processes that, are, that we expect to come into this, into this activity. So in summary, it, at the end of the day, we have developed methodologies to ensure that we can produce fuel that meets aviation's requirements. Those fuels can be made from a broad range of feedstocks, including starches and sugars, lipids, cellulose, and other unique hydrocarbon streams. And Scott will talk a little bit about more about that in a second. Hey, um, thank you, Steve, very much for the overview. Maybe um, to help our listeners and watchers, let's uh, just do some quick basics. So what is the difference between a renewable jet fuel and um, the biofuels that most Americans are used to seeing and hearing about, which would be ethanol uh, in gasoline and biodiesel? What's the difference between them? Um, so... Uh, commercial aviation, business aviation, and the military, uh, their aircraft fly with gas turbines, jet, jet engines. 
And those jet engines are um, certified to operate with a liquid fuel that we call jet fuel. Um, it's often it's known as other names like Jet A, Jet A1, um, and the military has uh, various names, but it's it's really a kerosene type of fuel. In order to maintain the operating certificate of all of those equipment, all of those pieces of equipment, we have to ensure that any renewable fuel that we make meets those same criteria. So all of the renewable fuels or the sustainable alternative jet fuels that we're qualifying actually mimic at a molecular level the same composition as jet fuel. So they're different. They are still they are still jet fuel, but they're different from biofuels that other people know about, like biodiesel or uh, ethanol, methanol, and some other uh, gasoline additives in that the uh, molecules that are produced in those cases are not the same as the parent petroleum-based liquid. Um, there is one slight difference. There are some folks that are pr producing uh, HDRD or uh, actual renewable diesel, and that's a corollary to what we're doing on the jet fuel front. Renewable diesel, as opposed to biodiesel, is a hydro-treated uh, lipid a product that actually has the same diesel characteristics as petroleum-based diesel. So we have created a different paradigm for aviation, and that is uh, producing fuels that are molecularly equivalent to jet fuel. It's just that we start with um, biomass instead of pulling um, petroleum crude out of the ground. Oh, thank you very if much. Go ahead, if Sarah. I could interject so well, too, I think it is also important just to remember that the properties of the fuel are very different, that the performance characteristics of a fuel at 35,000 feet are different than what the fuel needs to be um, for ground transportation, where we actually have to have low temperature characteristics while it will not gel, if there's an engine issue where you can relight the engine. So they're, they're just very different performance characteristics than a ground transportation fuel. Thank you. Um, and so if I can actually use that as a segue, Carol, um, how about if you tell us a little bit about NARA um, and uh, the feedstock to fuels um, project that you recently completed there in the Pacific Northwest? I would be happy to. Um, NARA stands for the Northwest Advanced Renewables Alliance. And NARA was um, created under a USDA grant um, that was a project that was led by Washington State University with several other partner organizations. And the goal of that project was to demonstrate that you could take what we call post-harvest forest residuals, so basically all of the the woody biomass, limbs and branches left over after forest harvesting. Um, that that could be converted to an intermediate product that could be turned into an isobutanol, so an alcohol product that could then be converted into jet fuel. So we were able to demonstrate using um, wood supplied by tribal lands and private lands um, in the Northwest. We were able to accumulate that deep stock. We were able to transport that basically grind it all up, convert it, um, ferment that to an, into an alcohol, and then convert that into a 1,000 gallons of um, uh, jet fuel that met the alcohol to jet conversion pathways. And the capstone or culmination of that project was flying that fuel on an Alaska Airlines flight from SeaTac or Seattle Tacoma International Airport to um, Reagan International yeah, Airport, the Reagan National zero. Airport in Washington, D.C. in November of uh, 2016. Um, there was multiple university partners who did demonstrate that the life cycle um, emissions benefit of the project, um, it, it was a complete success. We also had um, about one-third of the USDA grant money went to um, supporting education and outreach and reached many secondary grade school uh, instructors as well as students to bring up the next generation of uh, scientists to help bring this bioeconomy forward. 
Cool. Well, thank you very much, Carol. So uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to start to talk about what might be done, actually done here in Hawaii with Dr. Turn. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back. So um, we're uh, picking up where we left off, talking about sustainable alternative jet fuel and ways that it could actually be uh, uh, relevant to Hawaii and potentially made in Hawaii. I have a guest here in the studio with me, Dr. Scott Turn from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And, um, and uh, he's going to be talking about some of his research in this area, uh, some of which is actually done specifically for the Aviation Sustainability Center of Excellence that Carol Sim introduced to us at the beginning of the show. So, um, Scott, over to you. Maybe talk a little bit about your work. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, it's not just my work. Uh, I am at the University of Hawaii, and there are other individuals that are working with me. Uh, I'd like to get them on uh, the record. Uh, Richard Ogoshi, uh, Sharon Chan, Trevor Morgan, and uh, Adele Yukonis have all contributed to this effort. Um, so uh, the main uh, objectives of our uh, activities have been to um, conduct, um, and maybe you can cue the, uh, the image that I provided. Yeah, it's the um, it's a power it's the one PDF file, uh, an Adobe uh, PDF file called Pathways. So while while they're getting that up, I'll continue. Yeah. Um, so the idea here is that uh, uh, we've had um, a lot of agricultural land uh, become uh, available over the last oh. 10, 20 years. And uh, alternative jet fuel is, of course, one option for putting that land uh, back into uh, production. Um, and so one of the activities we've done is to do uh, a literature review of possible uh, biomass feedstocks that can be used uh, for uh, alternative jet fuel uh, production, a starting point, if you will. And then to look at what kind of conversion technologies uh, might be used, and what's the history of uh, uh, data available uh, for those conversion technologies uh, with the feedstocks of interest. Um, so um, what we'd like to be able to think about is providing uh, data and information needed uh, to make good decisions. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of land available in the state, uh, and so if we're going to uh, uh, try to put into a, a production facility and set up a value chain uh, production process, we'd like to make sure that uh, we do a, a good job the first time. So um, the, and if they had the image right now, that would be really helpful. <laughs> but uh, the... Uh, Maybe just um, talk about what are some of the feedstocks you've actually looked at in the field, sort of... Um, there we oh, go. There we go. So, okay. so, so talk about some of these... Um, feedstocks on the left-hand side of your image. Thanks. Uh, so on the left-hand side, uh, let's just talk about the diagram in general. The left-hand side shows uh, a number of orange, blue, and pink, purplish boxes. And those are the different bioresources that we've uh, reviewed and looked at for their application here in uh, Hawaii. Um, on the right-hand side are the alternative jet fuels that Steve has talked about. And uh, from the different pathways that he identified. So these are all coming from different types of feedstocks, but they all uh, come out and have uh, passed through uh, the, the uh, approval process or are in process. So 
what we're trying now to do is look at that image and make connections uh, with the resource on the left-hand side and the jet fuel on the right-hand side. Um, if we look at the gray boxes there, the gray boxes are, are pretty much proven technologies. So uh, if we can get uh, materials that can feed into the gray boxes, then um, we can, um, we should be able to produce the, the alternative jet fuel on the right-hand side. Um, and so uh, our reviews have been looking at the uh, resources on the right hand or the left hand side and then what information is available for their conversion uh, using the red and uh, conversion boxes that, that are sh shown there. Um, the, uh, all of the, the resources on the left hand side, you can think about those as providing um, four different types of feed, uh, feedstock material, either fiber, sugar, uh, oil, or um, uh, starch. And, and actually, the starch isn't shown there because we haven't uh, uh, identified any of those suitable for, for Hawaii. So um, after we pretreat some of them, we'd be able to uh, produce the intermediate products shown in the, uh, in the light blue boxes, and those would fit into the uh, gray conversion boxes uh, shown there. So our, our work has been reviewing the, the materials on the uh, left-hand side and then what kind of data and information is available for their conversion. Thank you, Scott. And so um, of those crops listed on the left-hand side, not everybody watching the show or even, uh, you know, not all of us are as expert in all those different agricultural products mm -hmm. as you are. So maybe talk a little bit about you know, what is a Lucena as opposed to a fiber sorghum, you know, what, what are those referring to? Okay. And maybe bring the image back up again. So uh, some of these, for example, we all understand what sugarcane is. Um, rice, we've done, uh, actually the review has been uh, for the tropics, so not just Hawaii. Uh, rice uh, is, is one of those that um, is, is present elsewhere and used elsewhere in the, or in the, in the tropics. But some of the uh, energy cane and banagrass, these are fast-growing grass species. Um, uh, fiber sorghum is also a fast-growing uh, um, grass. And uh, the lower set of boxes, uh, Jotropha, Kamani, uh, Pungamia, and uh, Croton are all oil producers. And so um, each of those has potential um, to have a main product. It could go to for alternative jet fuel. And we're also interested in coal products because uh, I think all components of the, of the material has to be used. Uh, the other two that are shown there, which aren't uh, agriculturally based, are urban solid waste and uh, waste fog. And fog stands for fat, oil, and grease. So those are also resources and, and quite often are the kind of low-hanging fruit. Um, uh, these are um, in the case of uh, urban solid waste, uh, materials that have uh, uh, tipping fees or costs associated with their disposal, uh, the fat, oil, and grease or fog uh, isn't in that category because uh, it actually has become a commodity now that's, that's sought after. So, uh, but all of these then have potential for um, use, and, and that's what we're interested in, in looking at further. Oh, thank you very much, Scott. And so um, we just have a couple minutes left, so we'll try and sort of bring all of this together. What we've talked about is sustainable aviation jet fuel and all the different things that you can make it from in Hawaii. Um, maybe, Steve, um, talk a little bit about cost. You know, uh, the, the pathways and the ASTM testing that you showed us looks very rigorous and looks quite expensive. So how is it possible to actually uh, do this kind of thing, uh, you know, at a cost that a commercial airline is willing to pay? Sure, and that's the challenge. Um, so what we've proven over the last decade is that we know technically how to create synthetic fuels that are acceptable for use. And the challenge now is whether we can produce those at a price point that makes sense. What we find for many of the processes that I talked about and Scott alluded to, we find that feedstock costs can be a uh, large proportion of the total final cost. So what we put into the process. So what? We put in these uh, 
biogenic sources, uh, fat soils and greases, starches, et cetera. We run them through, through a, uh, a um, bio, uh, bio um, chemical process or a thermochemical process and convert those to jet fuel. And uh, we find that the feedstocks can be, uh, you know, very high cost. So part of the challenge is finding low-cost feedstocks or working on the uh, development of feedstocks that, where we can get the cost down. And that's reflected in some of the commercial agreements that we see today. There's a company called Fulcrum, for instance, who intends to use municipal solid waste predominantly uh, where that feedstock coming into the conversion facility uh, can be free or very low cost. And in some instances, it can actually be a negative cost where the waste hauler is paying the conversion company to take that waste. And that's one of the examples that Scott is looking at in the islands uh, is the use of municipal solid waste and construction and demolition waste. Um, so that's really the challenge right now, and we're working with a lot of entities to, to determine whether we can get down to a reasonable price point. There are some policy mechanisms that exist today through the federal government, through state governments, that with today's technology and today's feedstock costs and the policy support, we can get down to an equivalent level of pricing to petroleum jet fuel. But our long-term goal is to try to be able to do that without having to use policy support uh, in the long term. Okay. Thank you, Steve. And maybe, um, Carol, if uh, we could um, bring you back up and, you know, uh, well, I introduced you as the new assistant director for the Aviation Sustainability Center of Excellence, but you did sure. just recently retire from Alaska Airlines and we're in the thick of this. So. What what have you seen in your experience that um, are opportunities as far as competitively priced uh, with petroleum renewable jet fuel? What recommendations would you have for the Hawaii market to focus on? Um, there are, and I, I can't speak directly to Alaska Airlines' involvement on various Hawaii projects, but there has been interest in projects in the islands and. One of the challenges in Hawaii is that um, fuel is just more expensive than it is on the mainland. So um, if we can look at producing a fuel locally that does not have to be imported, um, that will help um, lower some of the costs associated with the fuel. Um, in the projects that we have looked at you know, right now with petroleum prices the way that they are, um, it's really hard to get competitive with alternative fuels unless the facility is making various co-products, whether it's that Scott alluded to, um, whether that's animal feeds or another byproduct that can be sold on the commercial market that makes the, the price point for the, the refinery um, something they can offer to um, the airlines at a competitive price. Okay. Um, we're still Thank sort you. of in that chicken and the egg, um, which comes first. We need to get to commercialization. Um, I believe as petroleum prices go up, we will see those price points come closer together and help drive the industry forward. But it, it is the biggest challenge right now. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carol, mm -hmm. and thank you, Steve, for joining us. And thank you, Scott, for uh, joining us here in the room. Um, I'm told that we've come to the end of our 30-minute segment, and so thank you for your time and your attention learning about sustainable alternative jet fuel today and some of the other options that are out there as far as renewable transportation. So thank you again, and uh, thanks for appearing on ThinkTech. Thank you. So how'd that go?